Good evening everyone and welcome to the Mental Health Professionals Network uh, national webinar for tonight. I think that was a lovely introduction to the Mental Health Professionals Network for those of you who are not familiar with it and it, a lo the local networks are excellent if you um, have that opportunity. So tonight's webinar is working collaboratively to support students experiencing e exam anxiety. My name is Mary Amaleus. I'm a general practitioner and psychotherapist from Cairns in far north Queensland. Um, it's really exciting to see so many people logged on. So there was about 2,000, over 2,000 people have registered for tonight and so far there's about 640 different logins and um, it's excellent to have everyone join together in this way. Um, MHPN wishes to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands across Australia upon which our webinar presenters and participants are located. And on that note, I do want to just note that there are a lot of people from regional and rural Australia logged on, which is excellent. And we wish to pay respect to the elders past, present and future for the memories, the traditions, the cultures and the hopes of Indigenous Australia. And on this particular topic, I also want to acknowledge that um, Indigenous people have a particular view around social and emotional well-being, which I think is really relevant for our conversation tonight as well. Um, now you did have a um, introduction to our panelists tonight in the their bios were sent to you when you registered. So um, I'd just like to welcome each one of them individually first of all, and then I'll explain to you a little bit about the structure of the the um, webinar. So um, first of all, I'd like to introduce Associate Professor Craig Hassad, who is a GP in Victoria, and he also um, works at Monash University. Craig, you have a special in interest in um, mindfulness, and I wondered if you just wanted to tell us a little bit more about your mindfulness program at Monash. Well, yes, we're bringing it in uh, very much as a part of the core training for um, uh, nearly all of our degrees by now as core curriculum. but. Um, because it's really a life skill that uh, helps in so many ways and uh, mental health obviously is relevant tonight but also to help to function in challenging work environments. And uh, for those who are interested as well, the um, Future Learn course, the free online course that we have running through Monash and Future Learn is, uh, just um, went live again on Monday so people may be interested to have a look at that. That's one of our initiatives um, that we're offering to the world. Thanks Craig and we're really pleased to have you with us this evening. I'd next like to welcome Paul Jameson who's a school social worker. Now in our preparation for this, um, Paul told us that he works across 24 schools which I find astounding. Um, Paul, can you just tell us a little bit about the kind of work that you do in schools and perhaps the range of schools that you work in? Sure Mary, uh, yeah, I do work in a network of 24 schools but I'm I don't actually visit all 24 um, very often at all um, and I have main schools that I work in. The kind of work we do, we, we support um, students um, from government schools, all government schools, so including um, special schools and we, um, we help students that are experiencing difficulty at school. Um, so that might be due to um, mental health problems, might be due to learning difficulties, maybe due to a disability of some kind or um, uh, other other difficulties that students have. So we we work primarily to help help children um, experiencing difficulty at school and and helping them to um, overcome those those barriers to education. Thanks, Paul. It's great to have you with us for this particular topic. So um, thanks for being here. And next, I'd like to welcome Jody Nilsson, who's a clinical psychologist from far north Queensland. Um, Jody, you've got an interesting um, uh, addition to your training in that you did some a degree in anthropology as well, and I just wondered how that influences your practice as a psychologist. Oh, absolutely, I did a lot of kind of social cultural anthropology, so it just adds to the cross cultural dimension. So it means that as a psychologist, I'm always thinking culturally, which is beliefs and values, as the kind of centerpiece of how we construct the world that we live in. So <laughs> just basically I think with every person that I see I'm thinking, so how are they seeing the world? Okay, and it's great to have you here as well. I know that you do a lot of work with um, Year 12 students at this Loads at the moment actually. <laughs> I'd say May is the really pointy 
part of the year with U12 students. Yeah. And um, I would also like to welcome Professor Valsa Epen, who is a psychiatrist from New South Wales. Um, Valsa, you, you do a lot of academic work and you have a special interest in um, ASD, I understand, but also a lot of interest in young people with anxiety. Is there anything that's of particular interest to you in your work and your research at the moment? Um, probably the most important thing that's relevant for today is the comorbidity issue when you have autism with anxiety or obsessive compulsive type of symptoms or depression that's comorbid with um, a neurodevelopmental disorder, particularly autism. How do you differentiate? How do you manage? And those kind of things are of particular interest. And uh, it, it is a bit of a challenge sometimes. Uh, um, recently we were thinking about how uh, suicidal risk assessment might happen in a young person with also autistic traits and how difficult it can be in assessing risk. Mm -hmm. So of particular interest to me, the uh, overlap between the different uh, neurodevelopmental and anxiety depression. Thank you. And I know um, Valsa, our audience submits questions when they register. I would just note that we cannot address 2,000 people's questions, so apologies if your question doesn't get answered, but we, we have taken note of all of them. And Valsa, quite a lot of the questions were around ASD and anxiety, so that's really helpful having your expertise. Welcome. So just a few ground rules. Um, just remember that um, you in the chat box, everybody can see what's happening. So just remember that it it is a um, public forum, so behave as if it was a face-to-face -face activity. Please feel welcome to post your comments and questions for the panellists into the general chat box. If you find it too distracting, um, you can click the small down arrow at the top of the chat box and it, there's a little highlight there for you now, and that will make the chat box go away. If you do enjoy it, you're very welcome to um, chat with each other and um, depending on how busy we are, the panellists might also be involved with that chat box. So please have fun with it if you'd like to. Um, and your feedback is really important to us, so please complete the short exit survey which will appear as a pop-up when you exit the webinar. So, um, and what will happen is that our panellists will each give um, their particular disciplinary re response to the case study and then we'll facilitate a uh, question and answer session and try and bring in the questions from the audience as well. So these are our learning outcomes. So we're going to explore anxiety in students and using our case study. So looking at how to engage with young people to assess anxiety, looking at the key principles of providing an integrated approach in the early identification of young people at risk of suicide or self-harm due to stress and anxiety from the end of the school studies and identify challenges, tips and strategies for how we can provide a collaborative response together. So you've already read the case and um, in the interest of time I'm not going to go over it again but just to remind you that um, our discussion is going to focus around Jessica who's a 17 year old um, completing year 12 and experiencing various life complexities including in her family. So I'd first of all like to welcome Craig from the perspective of I guess both a GP and a mindfulness practitioner as to how you might respond to Jessica's story. And just to acknowledge, Craig's had to use the handset on his phone which is perhaps a little uncomfortable but it was just to improve the quality of our sound. Thanks Craig. Good, well thank you very much. Um, there are some things just to note on the history uh, that Jessica's got a stable home situation which um, is uh, very good at least from what we've seen. Uh, conscientious, but uh, like many conscientious students, they're uh, very vulnerable to anxiety, perhaps because they're a little bit too so conscientious. Um, social isolation, which seemed to be um, there as well. She's, um, although the work is having a positive effect, um, grumpy and emotional. And uh, it's not always easy to tell, is this just um, normal adolescence or uh, what point is it actually part of a mental health problem? Uh, because moodiness and so on can be very common. It's not always easy to tell for um, you know, other family members. Irregular sleep, which is uh, and a concern would be, is she online at night and I'll come back to sleep later on? And um, she seems to be reluctant to see the doctor. But um, 
she wants to be a, a dentist, um, but is it her motivation or her parents? And that wasn't um, 100% clear from the uh, the, um, the story, and uh, have to tease that out. Um, what's really driving her motivation to um, to achieve? And um, the GP refers Jessica to a psychologist. So the question really about what can the GP offer? Some GPs are very experienced in managing mental health problems and maybe the primary carer in other situations it would be very appropriate to refer. It depends on the individual GP and obviously what they negotiate. And uh, also noted her tendency to worry or ruminate a lot. And we'll come back to that in relation to mindfulness. Now from a holistic perspective or GP perspective, and um, that um, an open and non-confrontational consulting style. So just important to be curious and inquiring rather than a sort of a top-down approach or in any way telling or instructing or pushing her. So it's really, she's essentially an adult and a non-confrontational style. And it's really important to find out what's her agenda, what's she interested in, what are her issues, rather than perhaps how it might be framed by somebody else. Um, family or, or doctor as well to really inquire into her agenda. Um, would probably not prescribe medications, um, not convinced about the evidence necessarily um, for adolescents and children, although getting into adulthood, I mean, if um, uh, pres uh, prescribing antidepressants um, could be appropriate and probably more in severe depression, but certainly wouldn't be inclined to prescribe myself. And what I'd like to put a lot of emphasis on is a, a lot of the other things that can be really helpful in this kind of situation in um, preventing or managing mental health problems. And I'm just going to touch on a few things here, mindfulness, sleep, exercise, diet, spirituality and self-compassion. And, um, and it's very important um, perhaps to consider all of these areas because the aim is really to empower Jessica. Um, not uh, impose treatments on her, so to let her know there's a whole range of things she can do. Now I apologise in advance because uh, I've got a number of slides here, but I just wanted to present examples of evidence for the various things I'm going to be um, speaking about just very briefly. But this is one among dozens of studies now on depression, and there are review papers in many, many journals, but just to illustrate the point, 106 people uh, multiple episodes of depression before, given mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, plus treatment as usual or treatment as usual, and um, uh, the red lines, the relapse rate for the mindfulness group. So very few people or far fewer people relapse into depression if they have mindfulness training, along with whatever other treatments they're receiving. The blue line is just treatment as usual, um, mostly just the um, prescribing of antidepressants without um, other psychological um, therapies. And by 12 months, more than um, half have had their next episode of, um, of depression compared to the red line where um, relapse was much less common. Um, and of course, um, is it appropriate for adolescents? And then studies started to look at um, younger age groups, so mindfulness-based stress reduction, again, similar to adults, less anxiety, depression, somatic distress, increased self-esteem and sleep quality. The self-esteem is not about trying, from a mindfulness perspective, trying to think positive things about themselves. It's just not constantly feeding their negative self-talk that might be very common. So that rumination, how mindfulness can help to switch off that default mode rumination is very, very important. There are also programs in schools, and this is one review of 24 studies um, recently, and um, it's pretty clear that it improves resilience and um, ability to cope with stress and mental and emotional health, but also um, seems to improve performance at school as well because poor mental health can seriously impair academic performance. Um, and uh, oh, this is a study that we did um, with Origin um, Youth Health and um, just to, um, we looked at an in-depth qualitative um, uh, study and in a very short space of time, adolescents learning mindfulness skills really develop a lot more self-awareness, awareness of their own minds and bodies and how to work with that in a, a self-compassionate kind of way. Um, now, I won't say too much about default brain, but rumination and worry associated with depression, anxiety, are forms of default mode, and it's pretty much the mode of mind we go into when we're not mindful. So studies show that mindfulness switches off the default mode, so as soon as the attention re-engages with the present moment through the senses, um, then the brain becomes quiet again and switches out of rumination mode. But uh, there's not time to go into that in more depth. Um, I'll just skip on from, um, from that. Just talking about sleep, um, chronic insomnia is a major risk factor for depression. A lot of kids these days are getting depressed because they're online 
<clears throat> at night and sleeping poorly. And uh, for many people with depression, um, they actually need to learn to sleep better and a, a major, a very significant majority will have their depression resolved when sleep problems are a part of depression. And I just wanted to, to, to sort of um, mention that it is as common that um, depression is a, a product of poor sleep as um, poor sleep is a, a um, product of depression. Exercise and mental health, particularly aerobic exercise, has a range of um, mental health benefits including anxiety and depression. And um, obviously if it's engaged uh, with other people as well, there's ways of her being active that she enjoys, then that could also be an important part of the therapy as well. Um, I just wanted to mention about nutrition. Um, Deakin University have done a lot of work in this and just to draw your attention to this study of, um, it was uh, over 7,000 Australian adolescents and um, Q1, that's the 20% who had the healthiest diet, but Q5, the 20% with the poorest quality diet, um, they were nearly twice as likely to get mental health problems like depression. And uh, nutrition is almost totally forgotten as um, being a mental health intervention, particularly for kids who are not getting um, any whole food in their diet, um, are much more likely to have mental health problems. Um, and the other thing to mention as well about spirituality, and I don't necessarily mean that to be religious, although that's the, the way in which most of the studies look at it, but this is um, one review of um, studies on nearly 100,000 people. Two things I want to draw my um, attention to is, one, I think that the search for meaning is an important human need. But this just draws attention, this study, to the fact that an intrinsic sort of religious or spiritual dimension to a person's life society associated with better mental health, when it's just a, an external show, extrinsic, then it's not associated with better mental health. Um, the other thing is if a person's got a very negative coping style so that feeling the problems in life are all about being punished and so on rather than actually having a sense of a compassionate and caring sort of um, connection to the universe. Like Einstein said, I believe the universe was a, a benevolent place. So if a person has that very negative view of uh, religion as a, a coping, then it's associated with poor mental health. So, uh, it's, it's, but anyway, I just um, make the point that where does she find meaning in life? What gives her life purpose? What's going to enrich her? And self-compassion is perhaps the last thing I'll mention. That if a, a young person has self-compassion rather than self-criticism, um, uh, this is very important, not only for um, making amends for failing in a study, uh, in, you know, in, in you know, a test, for example, or making errors in life, but if a person meets those kinds of problems with intense self-criticism and self-judgment, then that's associated with much poorer outcomes. And there's quite a literature now that um, developing an attitude of self-compassion is not complacency, but an ability just to give ourselves a bit of latitude to be human and to learn from our errors and to be a little bit kind to ourselves. So, um, and, uh, uh, so that's perhaps all I wanted to say for now and um, we may return to a few of those issues and unpack them a bit more later on. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Craig. And if anyone wants to look at the slides for um, the presentation, they are in the documents box and obviously you can access that after the webinar as well. Um, Craig, it was great to have that as um, a, a sort of foundation for our discussion in that love, really holistic approach. Now um, I'd like next to welcome Paul Jameson who's um, our school social worker. Hi Paul. Hi Mary. Hi everyone. Um, yeah, thank you Craig for, for your comprehensive um, presentation and um, I guess my, my perspective as a school social worker is really coming from a perspective of education. In the case study, it didn't it didn't really um, talk a lot about um, what was happening at school. So I guess it leaves it open to to um, inquire as to what might be happening and and um, how we can intervene to help help um, Jessica. Now the one of the things that <clears throat> that I would be very interested in is is how she's going at school. Um, with the case study notice, notice, notes that she's a very conscientious student and studies very hard, um, but it doesn't say anything about what sort of grade she's getting or is she is she passing VCE or is she behind um, and what what contribution that might be having having, having towards her stress and uh, mental health. So that was definitely um, something I'd want to find out from her um, her teachers and her coordinators and speak to them. 
um, and depending on on how she's going, to to look at exploring um, any other options uh, for completing Year 12. Um, and in fact, if she does even have to, um, you know, complete Year 12 and and do the exams and get an ATAR score, or you know, is a is a Year 12 pass sufficient for her in terms of what pathway she wants to go down? So. Schools can do a lot um, with students um, around that, and um, and it would really depend on where she's at and talking with Jessica and talking with her parents as well. Um, the other questions I have around school is um, her level of engagement, um, and are there any concerns around disengagement, any non-attendance or school refusal issues? And again, that's that's not clear in the case study, and um, but um, you. You know, I would be inquiring with the coordinators um, around that. And then, um, any any things we can do to improve her level of school engagement is definitely a, a, a protective factor for Jessica. Um, we don't know what her level of engagement is at school, how well connected she is, what sort of social network she might have at school, what sort of relationship she has with her with her teachers. And uh, anything we can do to improve that um, and get her more connected will help um, Jessica's overall uh, mental health. Um, in there's also in-school referrals or in-school support, um, and schools have a lot of options for this. And and um, you know often it's it's an easier way for for students to access help at school. So often the schools will have a, a psychologist or a social worker. Um, a lot of schools have chaplains, a lot of schools have adolescent health nurses um, and other school counsellors and wellbeing staff. So generally um, a lot of high schools are well equipped to support students um, needing extra help. Um, so it would really depend on the nature of, um, of the difficulty she's experiencing and, and, um, and I guess presenting, presenting her and her family with options. Um, the other thing um, I'd be cons um, interested in is, uh, is is there any safety concerns for her and um, is there a need to do some safety planning at school and I'll, I'll talk about that more in a minute. Um, the other um, area I'd, I'd be in because she's doing year 12 and coming up to her end of um, schooling and, and going to proceed into um, tertiary education is really what kind of pathway Jessica wants. Now, the, the case study talked about um, interest in dentistry. We don't know why why that is or what's inspired that interest or motivated it. Um, or if she's um, explored other pathway options and career options. And um, there there is a lot of support out there. Schools are very good at um, helping students with this. And again, there, there's um, careers counsellors you can get through schools. Um, there's also career expos that um, many students attend and that provide a lot of help um, for students. And there's online careers um, course, course help also. Lastly, um, I want to talk about risk assessment and safety planning. Again, the case study doesn't make it clear what risk factors there are, but what are, what are, um, if there are any real safety concerns. There's certainly risk factors present for Jessica, and um, Craig touched on a lot of those. The, the social isolation is one. The, um, I guess, her, her real um, sense of um, dedication and, and wanting to do well at school and, and how um, much pressure she puts under herself is, is um, could be a concern. Um, it's, it's also a strength as well. Um, we don't know um, if there's been any history of suicidality and that's something I'd want to explore with her um, and, well, for it to be part of the assessment. Um, has there been any history of suicidality with Jessica? Any, history of suicidal thoughts, current or previous plans, previous attempts. We don't know that. Um, has there been a history of self-harming behaviour? Um, is she engaging in self-harming behaviours? Um, again, we don't know that. Um, and we can we can talk directly to Jessica. And um, But her teachers may also have um, be able to offer um, insights for that as also. Uh, what's her level of self-care, her current level? Um, she, you know, we, we there's concerns around sleep. Um, Craig raised issues around diet. Uh, we don't know what's what's happening for her in those areas. 
um, online behaviour. It's also something I I wondered at, you know, with the um, with the isolation and um, and the being up late. Does she is she engaged in um, online behaviour, social media? Is that a risk for her? Is it a potentially a protective factor for her? What what are her habits and um, and what's her behaviour like online? Um, we know with a lot of young people, it can be very protective for them, but it can also cause cause them to be very vulnerable as well. Um, is there any substance um, misuse issues for her? Um, it's certainly something you can explore with young people. And um, any other risk behaviours. So the I've put some links in the um, in the extra additional resources um, in terms of risk assessment and safety planning. There is quite a bit of support out there. Um, there's some good good um, tools you can use for safety developing safety plans. There's also um, a Safe Minds package which has been developed for schools and. Um, it's it's been specifically developed for Victoria, but um, other people from other states can access it as a guest. Um, and I've also put that in the resources page as well. Uh, thank you very much, Mary. I'm going to finish on that, yep. and I'm happy to answer other questions later. Thank you so much, Paul. And it's great to hear that there's so many possibilities um, in in school, and we'll be exploring it more in our um, discussion later. I'd now like to welcome Jody. Um, as a psychologist and um, how you might think about supporting Jessica. Thanks, Thanks Mary. Um, I think Craig and Paul have done a pretty good introduction. I think the first thing that we do, that I do definitely when I meet someone who's, who's studying and appears quite anxious and depressed is do a comprehensive biopsychosocial assessment of what's happening. Um, and I think in terms of Year 12 students and anxiety and depressive symptoms, um, you want to work pretty quickly just because there tends to be a, a lot of kind of drama surrounding everything falling apart at the last, last moment. Um, definitely agree with what Craig said, eating, sleeping and breathing being the kind of three key things that we start to look at to try and stabilise a young person. That idea that an animal in distress is is a person who's not eating, is not sleeping, and is not breathing properly. So if those key factors aren't stable, everything else is going to be quite wobbly around the edges. And then looking at problem solving. So this is where schools come in really well. And working closely with school support, I find, tends to manage a lot of the stress and anxiety really quickly. So getting straight onto the school, educating the parents about how to talk to the school, trying to get some pathway planning in, trying to get some spe specialised school support around you know, how to get out of exams or get extensions for assignments, just to get a bit of breathing space so everything can calm down and move forward as quickly as possible. But it also gives that sense of support and then validates the next step of therapy. It's almost like it, it shows that things can change quickly because what we want to do is kind of begin to change someone's perception about a hopeless situation because often by the time you get to the stage where you're this withdrawn and this anxious and this depressed, kind of holding that together and changing that kind of bunker down point of view is one of the most important things. So first, sorry, one sec, I'll just change my slides. So something that I definitely look at in terms of psychological treatment is noting the developmental stage that the person's at. We're talking about a year 12 person. That situation is quite different from a year 11 student, which is different from a year 10, which is again different from a year 9, or the perfectionism and stress and anxiety that we might see in a year 8 student. So just noticing that through this teenage years, and anyone that works in schools or a lot with specifically this age group, group you know that the, the differences in emotional maturity from one end to the other end is quite extreme. So you need to work within, firstly, the kind of age range you're talking about, but also I think looking at the degree of separation from parents. Some 14-year-olds are quite emotionally mature and independent, whereas some 17-year-olds aren't. So being able to gauge that is also quite good just to see where that, that ability to self-regulate sits at. So in terms of choosing a treatment style for people, I think it comes down to the individual, the stage, 
but then also even like a multimodal approach is quite important. I'd agree with Craig, mindfulness is just fantastic, particularly for an anxious mind. It calms it down and it focuses it really quickly and it's something that can be used in school and at home. Um, but I'd also say some of the ACT diffusive techniques, we get really good feedback on those, like learning how not to respond to a thought. I'd say that CBT particularly works well once that stress and anxiety has been removed from the picture. If you try and rationalise with a particularly anxious school student, that whole cognitive debate that needs to happen tends to fall apart pretty quickly um, and they don't seem to engage quite so well when they're at a heightened level of distress. So I'd be considering that in my treatment options. But going back to the idea of spiritual meaning, I'd also definitely be looking at some existential therapy. And everybody has raised the big elephant in the room. And that is, you know, why are you doing dentistry? <laughs> it's a hard one. I think if she had said she wanted to be a doctor, we might not question it as much, but there's something about dentistry that makes everyone say, why are you doing dentistry? Um, so I'd be looking to see where the pressures are coming from them. Is it because she had the idea when she was seven that she liked to be a dentist? Is that because it's not quite medicine? Is it because she has a passion for oral health? There's, there's going to be something amongst that, some reason. Um, and if that loses meaning, then the motivation is going to drop back. Something I would say though, if we're talking about shifting somebody's perception of a situation to try and get them around to challenging it and changing it, um, something that I see quite regularly is if we jump straight in and start talking about things that they can do to fix their cognitions, they tend to shut down pretty quickly. Um, it's almost like we're blaming them for the way they see the world and that's not very helpful whatsoever. So I think firstly trying to jiggle their perspective into looking after their health, showing that things can be done to change the situation at school and then turning in and starting to look at the beliefs and values and the thoughts that are influencing the really strong emotions tends to kind of make things far easier. So the specifics to this case, I think there'd likely be a lot of catastrophic thinking involved such as, you know, what are we going to do? You're going to drop out of school. She's going to fail. She's not going to get to uni. Um, so calming that down as quickly as possible would be my first focus. Um, and everyone's noted as well the relationship with mum. Now, I'd be looking at that relationship first. So there's obviously some perceived pressure there. Mum wants me to do this. Mum wants me to do that. So I'd be looking at trying to work out if that's really the case or is that a faulty cognition? Is that, is that just a perception because mum really wants me to but does mum really want me to or is she just happy with me doing what makes me happy? So getting those two talking, even though mum says that they're a happy family, they get along well together, we have just also have evidence that she's been hiding in her room for the past two years studying. So I would be wondering why. So is it perfectionism or is it to escape? the family lounge room. So looking at the family dynamics and what's going on there will show a lot of the underlying tensions um, that often fuel. So everyone in Year 12 is stressed. Well, not everybody, that's an exaggeration. Um, <laughs> so most people are quite stressed, um, particularly if they're going for a high rank. And it's the line where someone crosses from typically stressed or slightly anxious to depressed and so anxious that I can't complete any work. Um, it generally has to do with something else in their life. So either there's a lot of external kind of pressure pushing down from school, from home or from friends even. So a lot of competitiveness amongst friends or it's a lack of support. So I'd be looking for that so we could start to resolve that pretty quickly. I'd also do work on parents about educating them about how to talk to the school. Um, often parents don't understand that they can advocate for their child at the school and also find that career pathways now are so confusing even for me that, and I talk about it all the time, I'm still not clear. So I know that there are rank systems to get into university but I know that they don't really count so I might think I need one rank to get in but it's likely that with another rank I'll slip in somewhere. So I think that that creates even more anxiety for young people because you can't adequately plan your future if you don't know what you need to get there. Um, I'd also say that this is likely to be a crisis of 
her developmental stage. So Jessica, if she has had a stay-at-home mum and if there has been any enmeshment there, um, we know she doesn't have a wide social circle. Um, we know that she's just had this job and taken on this job that she really enjoys, that she's temperamentally kind of quite likely to be conscientious and shy. Um, is she going through like a normal kind of process of individuation where she's trying to separate from her family but can't, isn't able to acknowledge that or voice that or do that in a healthy way. That would be one of my thoughts. Um, so I'd definitely be talking about her existential crisis in some degree, like what do you want to do, what gives you meaning, um, and talking with her about living a life without joy or um, a lack of human con connection because those are both really key things that I think are missing. And kind of look at those questionings of those beliefs and values and being able to support those in a healthy way rather than just saying, that's it, I'm out. Um, finally, I've got a few questions that I'd probably ask just to find out what was happening. So um, asking where someone's most comfortable or least comfortable is a really good question to ask because it, it shows the place in which someone feels most accepted or emotionally safe. So if they say at work, that's quite indicative, okay, I found this place that I fit, so that's likely to make me question my future because this is where I feel belonging. Um, if it's at school that someone feels most comfortable, you know, why not home? What is it about school? If someone feels comfortable at home, then that's a good thing. Um, I'd also ask about what, the young, what Jessica wants from her parents, so what would be useful for them? What do, you, what do you need to hear from them to make this easier for you? And I'd be talking with parents about the ways that they can support Jessica rather than just pressure her and badger her about going to the doctors and seeing psychologists. Um, another question I also like to ask is asking somebody about their day. Um, so really clearly saying, tell me about your day yesterday. It's <laughs> stolen from Irvin Yalom, who's a psychiatrist in the States. And it always gives a really accurate picture of what a day looks like for someone. And I probably get more data from that than I do from most other questions. Just because you get a sense, you get them to really talk you through everything in the day. So are they talking to anyone or are they talking to everyone? You know, I've found <laughs> out that I'm someone's gonna... accessing help from like three or four different sources um, just from asking that question. So I think I should finish there because I know Vals is going to speak now and she's going to actually talk more yeah. about the assessment. Um, so I hope that's covered everything. I just tried to get everything in there. Thank you. And we did sort of talk on the dentistry question earlier, and I'm sure we'll come back to a lot of it. And so thank you for that. And I'd like to welcome Valsa. So probably um, being the psychiatrist, Valsa, you might be the, the person who met Jessica um, after some of the others had. And so I'd really like to hear how you would think about this situation. Thank you very much. Um, it's probably a good thing that I'm going last because most things have been covered, but I'm going to assume that by the time they come to see a psychiatrist, a child psychiatrist, um, either it's because it's more severe or there are other issues also going on. So I'm going to probably take that uh, extreme end for a minute to, to describe what might happen in that space. Uh, Definitely in the assessment situation, you'd be considering the severity, the duration, and also how long has this been going on. Sometimes you don't realize when it really started. You might think that it started three months ago, but there may have been symptoms from before. There may have been a past history of few symptoms here and there for a period of time. So those kind of things will need to be carefully explored. And if you think that um, there is uh, severe anxiety uh, together with some depressive symptoms, then you need to consider the urgency of treatment. And again, in an HSC student, are we talking six weeks from trials and what would that mean to someone? Uh, what kind of treatment would you suggest in that situation might be slightly different if you saw them at a different point in time. So that's kind of very important to gauge um, when you're assessing. Within the clinical features, it's also very important that anxiety can sometimes be uh, the front runner and maybe there is depression and related symptoms hiding behind. So um, it, it is very important that we try to um, unpack that a bit. 
mostly going into the specifics of what are the kind of anxiety provoking situations. Is it more social? Is it more generalized? Is it about everything? Is it only about assignments or the whole life in general? And again, with depressive symptoms, you might want to go dig a little bit into the sleep and appetite. It can be either more or less. Um, either of it can, uh, can be a symptom. And also, you would be looking at everything has become an effort. Are they very um, tired and there's a lot of psychomotor retardation? And that kind of thing would also give you a glimpse that it's kind of really probably a little bit more severe than what originally was seeming to be. Uh, of course, you might also look into whether there are any bipolar type of symptoms or psychotic symptoms especially if the, if the young person has been kind of withdrawing themselves and what else is happening would be very important to look into. Sometimes somatic symptoms like headache maybe or abdominal pain or uh, nausea vomiting, that may be uh, the, the symptom that is the main concern for the person, but it may be resulting from anxiety which is underlying those somatic or physical symptoms. Once that um, presentation uh, and the nature of that is clarified, you would then need to look at where is it coming from? What are the things? Um, is there any family history? Of course, what we heard is that it's all, all well in the family, we are happy and all that, but sometimes a family history may not come out um, in the first instance and you may need to carefully ask about what kind of a person is um, each one and you know, are they really joyful, bubbly, or they can't their take on life is more negative? So those kind of things would be very important, even if there is no major mental health issues, exploring what kind of um, personalities they have. Relationship issues would be extremely important, both at school and at home. Sometimes friendships are either uh, not fitting in or uh, sometimes an acute uh, breakdown in a, in a relationship maybe what's presenting um, the severity or the uh, coming to, uh, to the forefront at this point in time. So interpersonal conflicts both at home or um, generally friendship relationships would be something that you would want to really understand in a young person presenting with anxiety and, and probably depressive symptoms as well. Also you need to um, dig a little bit into what happened at, at the time when they relate to us the start of the symptomatology. Um, was there any bullying? Was there the pressures of wanting to get the grades to be a dentist became head on at the start of year 12? Uh, is it the high expectations that the person has put on herself or is it coming from um, the parents or others? Uh, sometimes they have internalized it so much that they think it's their own, but it may be coming from others. Sometimes they may be projecting it onto others and thinking that mom and dad would want me to do, but it's actually their own high expectations and their own agenda. So we do need to understand a bit more of that. And being perfectionist is a, is a great thing at times, but can also um, get things undone, uh, especially when you're working under time pressures with assignments one after the other coming on, uh, that probably would really be a huge stress on a person who is wanting to get everything um, right there. So risk assessment would also uh, be something that uh, has already been covered, and so I will just kind of give the risk assessment part. I, I would also look at uh, whether there are any other diagnostic considerations. I said about the bipolar disruptive mood dysregulation disorder is a new category that DSM-5 brought in, mainly for persistent irritability, anger outbursts in a young person, uh, but not uh, really, it's not bipolar. Um, premenstrual dysphoric disorder is again a common thing, um, maybe that's superimposed on an underlying anxiety and that can really bring things to a head, so, but the temporary relationship with the menstrual cycle would give you the clue. Is there substance misuse or any other medication or something else induced mood change? Is it due to a medical condition, particularly you know, thyroid issues or uh, vitamin deficiencies. Now, when you are treating, your goals of treatment would be to relieve the symptoms, um, reducing the functional impairment. That's, that's, that's very important. That how can we improve the person's um, coping, adapting, and being functional 
is a key thing uh, as the goal for your treatment, along with improving quality of life. And again, you have to have the patient on board. Um, it's very much um, the thing that you can have the best treatment plan, but if they don't come on board, then that's not going to be any good. So engaging the person, it's a patient-centric perspective, collaborative approach uh, that is very important for treatment adherence. And again, failing, if they are failing to engage at all or failing to engage in kind of sessions where they have to come and talk to someone, internet-based interventions can be uh, sometimes useful for the person to get some help if they are not willing to come and engage with the person. Then again, school and family support would be important too. So the medication uh, would be reserved when it is very severe, extreme panic, extreme distress, um, as I said before, hopelessness, guilt, suicidality, or psychomotor retardation, severe obsessive compulsive symptoms. Uh, you would need to also look at comorbidities because uh, autism or ADHD or other things can complicate both the presentation and your management. Um, substance misuse and personality traits would also be a consideration. Uh, some of the, this slide, m many of the things on the end with the lifestyle factors have been covered. I would also think that the psychological, psychosocial um, support issues have been covered. Uh, the medication, uh, when you do use it, it's only for uh, moderate to severe and for very specific um, markers that you would think about carefully before you, you start medication or think about medication. But having the patient on board and the family on board is extremely critical um, for that. So it would be a uh, biopsychosocial lifestyle uh, model is probably what would be worth going in with. Thank you. Thanks very much, Valsa. And now I've, I'm going to open us up to the um, question and answer session. And I'd like to start by inviting Craig back in. Now, Craig, as a GP, I know that you, you spoke about engaging with Jessica herself, who's nearly an adult. As a GP, you often see the family. Well, how would you approach it if, if mum, for example, had an obvious anxiety disorder of her own, which was impacting on Jessica, but Jessica, you know, but the problem is people are trying to locate the problem in Jessica. These are the sort of questions that have come up a lot from the audience as well. So how do we think about the family? Oh, look, I think that's a really relevant question. Um, there may not be a problem with Jessica at all. I don't think we're assuming that in this situation, but sometimes parents are worried um, and it's their own anxiety they project. Very often parents who have a very anxious way um, in their own life will teach their children from an early age to be anxious. I was, I'll just quote one study. I, was, I do a lot of work with um, schools and um, was looking at uh, five-year-old children and their level of maths anxiety and maths performance and how that correlated with their parents' maths anxiety and performance. And they found there was a strong correlation, but only if the parents regularly help their children with their maths homework. If a parent was anxious about maths but didn't uh, help their child with their maths homework, the child was fine with maths and they weren't anxious about it. And I guess it just illustrates the point that very often parents aren't teaching their children what they think they are, they're teaching them how to be anxious. So you, you would want to um, have a conversation with the parents if uh, Jessica was happy to have a conversation with them both together, of course, having a conversation with Jessica by herself. But um, it's going to be a family issue um, in how they cope, but also uh, in you know what the parents are projecting onto her. So absolutely, it's a really important point. Thanks, Craig. And now I wonder, um, Paul, if um, this is really about collaboration. So how 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 would you feel if, for example? Craig as the GP or perhaps Jody as a psychologist rang you as a contact person in the school. What, what are the sort of nuts and bolts around how those conversations go? Yeah, great, good question, Mary. Look, it is really critical, uh, the collaboration from a school's perspective and, um, you know, we're, we're school-based or certainly my role, my role is school-based, so we, we need to collaborate um, with external um, professionals um, and, and specialists. So um, I would be would be very um, you know welcoming of, um, of being able to collaborate with, with someone like um, Jody or, or Craig. Um, look look it's um, 
it's probably trying to work, you know, not, not over, overlap and not duplicate what we're doing. So really having a discussion around um, what, what kinds of things we can help with at school um, from the school perspective and um, also what, um, what you'd be looking for, for an external um, service provider to be able to do. I guess the other really important thing is, um, you know, with ensuring we've got proper consent and, um, and ability to share information, but but just making sure that we're we're um, we're communicating um, and we're we're both um, talking about what what we're doing. So if the school's already having discussions around um, career planning and, and pathway planning, then um, then it may not be necessary for someone like Joey to to explore that in as much depth. Um, or and you know similarly, if um, the schools already had the had the discussion around um, doing something in terms of the course and um, her her studies and possibly um, reducing some of her study load or, or lengthening the time period that she's going to complete a VCE over, um, then it wouldn't be necessary for for external people to look at that. So you know I'd I'd be really keen to um, to Get the good communication happening, so we can um, we're not we're not duplicating and, and not causing more confusion for Jessica and her family. And I think Paul, that you had a, a question for Jody in particular around um, around the family. I'm not sure whether you, whether you'd like to to frame that one. Yeah, I would. Um, and look, you know, it was. Um, I guess it was similarly similar to the question you put to um, to Craig. But Jody, what would you suggest or recommend to support the family, particularly around dealing with mental health issues in the family and challenging preconceived expectations and gender roles? I think in terms of supporting the family, something we do here is depends. It depends on what's going on. If there are dynamics within the family. Um, Suggesting that parents get their own support um, and knowing those people in the community, so having good working relationships with different services, so the mum or the father or both can go and speak to them a few times and you know that they're going to get like good care and everything's going to go well and smoothly and there's not a big waiting list, for example. Um, that's mm. one thing. In terms of the gender issues, that goes down to that beliefs and values side of things. So we know that mum's education has a direct influence on how likely Jessica is to go to university. So that, that, that research is out there. Um, so we know that mum's expectations might be hard but being able to support Jessica to do that might be difficult. So the gender, the gender roles that maybe Jess sees replicated in her house aren't necessarily the ones that are being explained to her or put onto her, but her beliefs and values will be a really tense, complicated version of both of them put together. So I definitely speak to her about those, um, just so mm -hmm. she can at least understand where that tension comes from. Thanks, Jodie. Right. Now, I'd, and thank you, Paul. I'd like to just, um, um, I was interested in Valsa's slide at the end um, with the biopsychosocial perspective and that lifestyle things included things like exercise and nutrition, whereas Craig had raised the idea that they were in fact biological treatments. So I, just, I, I think I'd like to just invite Valsa and Craig um, perhaps to have a, have a, perhaps Craig if you start just around exercise I guess as a biological treatment. Yes, it's, um, there's quite a, a large literature on this, um, particularly aerobic exercise um, just by itself um, is therapeutic for depression and anxiety. Um, but uh, it's, all, it's not just the physical activity, I, I believe. I think it's also that when a person's doing something they love or something that really engages their attention, they're actually being mindful at that time as well. So the mind's unhooked from its usual rumination. A person's had a break from that for a while. So the person feels a bit more clear-headed, a bit more relaxed, energised and so on. So, But the other thing to add too in exercise, particularly if it involves other people being active with your friends um, and uh, it you know wants to be a form of activity that she enjoys but um, you've got the social interaction as well. On the nutrition side of things um, there's quite a literature on this as well and I don't think it's recognized enough in mental health areas that um, 
if the if the body's not got the right nutrition coming in, then the body can't make all the neurotransmitters and everything else it needs to make. It can have a pro-inflammatory effect, which is un, unhelpful as well. And if there are specific um, deficiencies, uh, vitamin D, folate, um, for example, um, if those deficiencies are not um, corrected, then you don't get the same therapeutic outcome. And there's quite a, a quite a literature growing up around this as, uh, now as well. It's not like if a person's got a normal vitamin D or it's got um, healthy levels of folate, if you give them more, they're going to get you know health, happier. It's just that if the person's got a deficiency, you get a much poorer therapeutic outcome unless you correct that deficiency. And so in the total management of mental health problems, we need to be thinking from all sorts of different um, perspectives because when you put all of these things together, you have a much more powerful therapeutic outcome than if you just direct your, uh, your interest and attention at one avenue for, um, for therapy. Thanks, Craig. And I would like to bring Valsa in. I, I noticed that, Valsa, also you also spoke about the biopsychosocial um, approach and, and exactly what Craig was just saying about considering all those things. I guess what would there, would there, this may be an unfair question to spring on you, but would, would there be a message that, that you would like to convey to general practitioners around um, using SSRIs in young people? Um, yeah, I, I, I would say that um, if you carefully select the ones that you would want to put on the medication, that would be very rewarding, especially if you have got someone who is having significant panic symptoms. Your ability to get them to do any psychological work with you or even the um, lifestyle modifications might be extremely difficult. So if you have got severe panic symptoms, if you have got severe psychomotor retardation, where everything is an effort, there is no uh, motivation, apathy, lack of interest, uh, those, that, that, those kind of patients you probably would be wanting to give the medication along with all the biopsychosocial lifestyle bits. The reason why I say it is important to get the other bits in is when you are in a stress, whether it's panic, it is fight flight reaction or otherwise, you're using up a lot of your chemicals. And it is only natural that the levels are going to go down and down and you put yourself in a very vicious cycle. So there is only so much you can spend less. And I always say that psychotherapy and other um, interventions, supportive ones, are about spending what you've got well. So you can spend your chemicals well using all those strategies or boost up your chemicals by having the exercise and the diet and everything and the sleep hygiene, everything sorted. So it's a little bit of both. When you, your levels are so low, when you are really broke, you do need a bank loan. So you would use the medication in those kind of situations, but you can take the loan forever, but that will not improve your situation unless you learn to spend it well and get your balances kind of in order. So it is a bit of a combination of the two, and the very carefully selecting those patients with severe anxiety, very severe panic, psychomotor retardation, or urgency because of suicidality or hopelessness, guilt, where you, know, you can lift them to a level where other measures of intervention and teaching them how to spend your chemicals well and all those things can then come on board. But then that initial phase, it may be uh, a very important uh, thing for them to kind of lift themselves up a little bit to a position where they can then use the other methods of treatment. And also, Val, so there's been a lot of questions from the participants around any special considerations when people have ASD. Um, you know, trays or, or a full diagnosis. Um, obviously, it's more complicated, and you spoke about the importance of trying to assess what what's what. Is there any particular um, considerations with regard to if you make the decision to prescribe medication and ASD? Yeah, because you may not uh, be able to engage the patient in a way that you would like to understand what's going on, what's the severity, etc you would be looking at external factors, like is there any significant recent change? They used to enjoy something or they used to do this, uh, but now they are not interested in that. Or when you see something which is very recent, which is an important change, and then you put the pieces together and the sleep and the appetite, the biological symptoms, vegetative symptoms can give you the clue that it is very severe. Um, it, it again, um, 
even if they have got ASD symptoms, it, it is important that you try to get the person on board uh, and, and then together with that uh, patient and the family, you develop the kind of management plan. And I think that just because somebody has got ASD, especially this is a person attending school and functioning okay, then it is uh, possible to um, get them to at least engage with you on a particular symptom that they would like to get rid of. Sometimes they would say there's nothing wrong with me or there's, there's no problem or don't want to engage, but see where there is an issue where you can agree that there's a problem. Sometimes it's sleep or sometimes it's something that you kind of stumble upon from somewhere, but you do need to find that little anchor point where you get the person to engage. Let's see whether we can get that a little bit better and wouldn't that be good to to do that, then shall we give it a try? And so it's very important to find that common ground somewhere, even if it is a little bit of a sleep problem, it's an irritability that they recognize is not good or inability to focus on uh, things that they used to enjoy, which they can't, which is frustrating them that they can't do it uh, anymore because they have become apathetic. And so there was one young person recently told me that the apathy was killing him. I mean, to come that, that from a, a C person I thought was kind of truly remarkable, but they, it may be possible if you really kind of uh, get them to, to explore with you what would be the one thing that you would want changed or to agree on something where you kind of meet on the crossroads and then take them with you. Grab Thank the you. hand and then take Thank them with you. you. Thanks, that's really helpful. Um, we, I should have said we have had 860 people, um, we had 878 earlier. Um, we are approaching the end and as usual this discussion is never uh, long enough but I would just, I know that Jody, you had a question for Paul around when, when you as a psychologist become aware that the young person's um, uh, hopes and expectations for themselves probably are not academically possible. Um, would you like to just address that to Paul? Yeah, I was just wondering if Paul's had this where someone is incredibly anxious and distressed because they're trying for a certain rank to get to university and then when you actually look at their marks or well, the feedback for me from the school is they're never going to get there. So I have a problem as a clinician because I practice unconditional positive regard, completely aligned with the young person. Yeah, you can do this to a certain degree but then when there's this crushing reality that this isn't going to happen, but that isn't being conveyed directly by the school. I was wondering how, if you had any ideas about how to approach that. Yeah, thanks for the question, Jody. Look, it is something that does come up, and um, and it is is a difficult um, issue to to manage. Um, it's it's not all that common, but but it is something that does need to be deal with, dealt with because. Um, for a young person, they can put themselves under incredible stress and anxiety um, in trying to achieve something that just may be completely unrealistic for them. Um, so it, it's got to be a process, and um, and I think you do need to include the um, parents in the discussion um, with the young person. And um, but you know you would hope that that discussion could be had earlier um, with the young person so that um, you can be talking to them about what their goals are and, and I guess trying to steer them towards something that might be more realistic for them um, and helping to manage some of their um, um, the, the goals and what they're wanting to do and achieve. And, and you can use um, uh, certainly um, the careers counsellors at school can help with that, um, but also their coordinators can help as well. Um, and when they're in year 12, um, you know, their coordinators do work um, quite intensely with the young people around um, around their, their course and how they're going, how they're tracking with them with it and, um, and monitoring their stress. Um, there, there could be a role for, for the wellbeing, specialist wellbeing staff at the school, but it really depends on what, you know, who she's linked in with externally. So, um, yeah, I guess um, my advice would be to try not to identify it early. Um, a collaborative approach is really important and, um, and the sooner you have the discussion, the better uh, with the young person. And um, use, bringing other people to assist as well can, can be really helpful. Thanks for that, Paul. 
Now we've just um, we, we're going to just be finishing up. So I think um, Jody, we might get you back on for a moment. And I just wonder if there's just one final message that you that you would like to um, share with the panel and the participants before we close. Um, I think the big thing with Year 12 stress particular is it's been identified by lots of teachers that they all get sick of it. So there's there's a percentage of everything that's happening in Jessica's life that is completely typical and normal and it's about isolating that and pushing it to the side and then problem solving from my perspective pretty quickly um, to help her actually feel like there's some hope and push back those depressive symptoms as quickly as possible. Thanks Jodie. Um, Craig, we haven't heard from you for a while and I, I, I'm sure you've been thinking a few things so I'd just like if there's any kind of um, final messages that you, you'd like to give us all around just how we, we help someone like Jessica with exam stress in Year 12. Well, look, I, I think um, so many wonderful points have been made by the whole panel. Um, I think one of the things for somebody at this age to also consider is that you know, at various times life can be very difficult. I mean, if I reflect on my own life, um, you know, there were some pretty challenging times, year 12, university and so on. And I, th I think if, if a person can have a larger view at this time of life that having challenging times is, is certainly very uncomfortable, but this is a real opportunity for growth and insight. And if she um, uh, learns to work with this in the right way, find support from important people, explore things that might be useful, then then she'll come out a far better person than she was before. So to turn adversity um, into advantage I think is a really important way to have an idea of, of growth and development as you go through your life. And um, so I, I think that's a, an important sort of underpinning attitude for the, for the therapist and also for um, uh, a young person such as Jessica. Thanks Craig. And I know that that, that um question about growing through adversity did come through in the questions from the registrants at the beginning so that sometimes people need to make mistakes and learn from them and that, mm. that's how we build resilience. So I'm, I'm really glad that, you, that you've that you raised that. And um, I would like to now invite Valsa back in just to give us um, some final points that, that you think are really important to leave us with. Yeah, I, I probably would want to stress that each and every person who is coming with an anxiety or depression or a different type of um, issue to do with mental health, I think the first and foremost and the most important ingredient in any uh, approach to help them would be that um, establishing that um, relationship and getting them to share that uh, the most difficult bits with you. And that uh, patient-centric therapeutic alliance, no matter what your role is, um, that probably would be the most important thing that you would be doing for that young person, uh, much more than probably you, you, your professional um, role and what you do professionally. The number one ingredient would be that relationship that you build with the person and that, 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 that's probably the one that you need to initially concentrate most on, so getting to understand the person, the person thinking that you are there really for them, their uh, well-being is at the heart of what we are doing and, unless, and until they take that on board, whatever else we do may not be very beneficial. It's a really important point, Valster, and I, I like the way that Dan Siegel um, proposes a model of the mind and stating that it's both embodied and relational. And I think that's really come through tonight. We've talked a lot about um, biological and body things and you've just really beautifully reminded us that all of us as um, people who work in schools or therapists or social workers, GPs, have this opportunity for relationships that can be therapeutic. So I'm really grateful to you for bringing that in. And um, last but definitely not least, I'd like to just invite Paul to just sum up some final points for us. Thanks, Mary. Um, yeah, look, for me, the, I guess the critical issue is around um, making sure communication is um, is good between the school, home, and the external agencies involved with Jessica. Um, yeah, and and you know that everyone is is um, 
able to talk and, and we and there's a common understanding about what's going on for Jessica and um, both at school and at home. Um, the other thing that I think is, is really important is um, you know, the, you know, she's in year 12 and she's coming up to finishing her, her schooling and, um, you know, we don't know what, what how significant um, the engagement and attachment to school has been, but that, that's about to come to an end. And, um, and, you know, thought needs to be given to that transition for her um, from, um, from schooling, which may have been a real protective thing for her and, and a strong, strong connection for her. Um, and there might be a, a lot of anxiety around her, her finishing um, study at school, a place where she's been for a long time, and uh, moving on to, to what she's not quite sure about. So um, there could be some, some work that could be done there to help her and assist her and, and also her family. Um, and I think that would be really important to look at as well. Thanks, Paul. That's a really critical point. And I, I must say, some of the young people I see with anxiety in Year 12, it's not about Year 12 at all. It's about the future and the unknown. So I'm really grateful to you for raising that as well. Now, um, I can see that the participants have been really um, engaged and, and um, finding this a really valuable discussion tonight. So I'd like to thank all our panellists. Um, um, participants, if you, if you just stay on for a couple more minutes, it's really important for us to get your feedback at the end when you log out. I'd like to thank Craig for just reminding us about having a really holistic approach, um, thinking about exercise and nutrition and physical well-being, relational well-being. Um, and Paul has really opened our eyes up to the number of possible uh, supports in the school, which is probably a lot more than some of us knew were there, and the flexibility that's possible and the importance of trying to engage with the school in problem solving, which is, I guess, one of the things that Jody emphasised, is to actually quickly act to try and help solve problems, which can help reduce stress. And Jodie's also um, kept us thinking about the importance of the culture for the person, which might be their actual cultural background, or it might also be their family culture, and how are they viewing the world. And then Vals has reminded us also about the, the value of medication sometimes in, most, in very severe symptoms, but also beautifully at the end, that no matter what your profession, what your um, background, the, the therapeutic relationship with the young person is really the most important thing and I guess without which it, uh, you know, other things that can never be as effective. And interestingly, I am aware that that even includes medication. So thanks so much everybody for um, participating tonight, for the audience for being so lively in the um, chat box and for all our panellists for an excellent and interesting discussion. Now you'll notice there on the screen that there's an, another MHPN webinar on the 20th of June which will be equally interesting for those of you who work with young people. So working together to support people who deliberately self-harm um, is a topic that often causes us great anxiety and I'm sure that the um, discussion will be really helpful for that. Please ensure that you complete your exit survey before you log out and it will come up on the screen and you will get emailed your certificate of attendance um, for this webinar within a couple of weeks and you will also be sent a link to all the online resources associated with this webinar within a week. Um, and if you are interested in joining one of the youth networks, you can see the link there or any other local networks in fact. It's really helpful to also meet face to face with people in your local area and those local networks help with cre um, creating collaborative care which is best practice and results in the best uh, outcomes for clients. And um, before I close, I'd like to acknowledge the uh, consumers and carers who have lived with mental illness in the past and those who continue to live with mental illness in the present. And I'd like to thank everyone for your participation this evening and we look forward to seeing you at another webinar. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night.